Before we begin the explanation of each of the archetypes and their different manifestations in the psyche, we have to define what an archetype is. For the purposes of this video, we will build on the definition presented by analytical psychology founded in 1913 by the psychiatrist Carl Jung. Carl Gustav Jung understood the archetypes as universal, archaic patterns and images derived from the collective unconscious as the psychic counterpart to instinct. They are legacy potentials that are updated and they enter as images in the consciousness or manifest themselves in behavioral patterns in interaction with the outside world. Archetypes are the way some experiences and memories of our early ancestors are given to us in a psychological lens. This implies that we do not develop in isolation from the rest of society, but that the cultural context influences us in the most intimate, transmitting to us schemes of thought and experimentation of reality that are inherited. The topic of this video is based on Robert Elmore's book Facing the Dragon, Confronting Personal and Spiritual Grandiosity. There is a chapter titled Decoding the Diamond Body that introduces us to a structural revelation of the mental vices we can suffer if we are not aware of these energies that move us to act under the darkest impulses that lie deep within us. There are numerous archetypes in the psychoanalytic literature, but today we are only going to focus on four symbols that are projected into all cultures throughout human history. The metaphor Robert uses to understand this conflict of inner greatness or grandiosity is that of the dragon in the four quadrants. Each quadrant takes us to a psychic territory that each individual experiences throughout his or her life. Each person may experience an imbalance in each of these archetypes depending on the experiences and the pathological inclinations of one's personality. We will all at some point be psychologically confronted by this dual creature called the Dragon of Grandiosity. In the beginning, only chaos existed as an unstoppable force of divine nature, like the goddess Ares in Greek mythology. Just look at them. I pull one tiny thread and their whole world unravels into chaos. Glorious chaos. In the evolution of the psyche, the cosmos created a space where contrasts had to subsist and balance chaos with order. It is in this space that the king and queen emerge within the universe of archetypes. These archetypal figures are the ones who bring blessing and balance to their environment when the quadrant is balanced. In this quadrant, the dragon operates from the monarch complex, turning the individual into a center, alien to otherness. The king must resolve the conflicts that chaos expels, and to achieve this, he needs a strong psychological structure if he does not want to fail and create a fragmentation in the psyche. This pathology fits the need to be adored by the rest of the world in a constant way. A king or queen possessed by this dragon tends to show his or her arrogance as a camouflage of his or her own vulnerability. Someone has stolen my 
This quadrant tends to fall into the abyss of the narcissistic complex, if not adequately contained, and a leader incapable of accepting criticism seeks only adulation and power. As Dr. Ramani points out, the universe of narcissism is complex and increasingly present in our culture. You know what? The pattern of narcissism, it's awful. They may be fine with it, but you as the recipient of that pattern, it's not, it, it's, you, you're going to struggle with it. It's uncomfortable. It's one of those patterns that's really unhealthy for the people around it. I call it the secondhand smoke of psychiatry. Like being near a person who's narcissistic, it, it's as unhealthy as doing it yourself. The difference from the first quadrant to this one is the way in which both find the meaning in their existence. The king commands and blesses, but it is the warrior who fights and acts. His character is disciplined and strategic. This quadrant is not presented on a throne, but on a battlefield. This entity needs something to fight for. Without a defined path, the warrior can feel stagnant and lost in the chaos of the outside world. To understand the warrior is important to understand uh, the meaning of mission, a purpose that serves the ideal that most moves the spirit. When the warrior finds his path, it is difficult to shape his actions and make him change his route. This energy is immensely powerful and, like every quadrant, the dragon can upset and turn the personal struggle into a paranoid situation. A paranoid person is a person possessed by the energy of the warrior. Vigilance towards the enemy, which can be any obstacle that opposes the ideal of this archetype, can expand and create disturbances of reality. Fear intensifies to the point that the individual wants to control everything. A workaholic is a very appropriate example to understand the possession of the warrior in the psyche. Symptoms related to obsession and insanity are common in this quadrant. Unlike the narcissist who only seeks adulation like the king thirsting to be seen and adored, the warrior tends to believe that if he stops fighting or working to achieve whatever he is seeking, the world will collapse and chaos will dominate within his spirit. The warrior is always close to death. His vision of the world is based on the dependence of the quality and quantity of his activity. The dragon can isolate the warrior and transform him into a monster addicted to completing counterproductive tasks and destroying everything that hinders him. We now go to the third quadrant. This space belongs to the magician and the Axis Mundi, also known as the spiritual center. Here, metaphysics is expressed in the union of contrasts and the mastery of early elements as a bridge to the divine. The magician represents the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom gained by experience. Like the artist, the magician masters a technique sustained by repetition and concentration. This archetype is associated with the intellect and the mystical. In this psychic area, the dragon can possess the mind and transform the individual into an entity of arrogance, a dark being dominated by pomposity and the domination of Gnosis to excel the ego's desires. When the magician is unbalanced, he can destroy and divide. These third quadrant is usually more introverted than the previous two. 
All of its symbolism represents hermeneutics and the theory of interpretation. The magician is a master of symbols and alchemy. This energy covers everything related to psychology, academics, and research of all kinds. The world of the magician is a rich and powerful one, and the quality of detail and precision that this archetype carries helps us to appreciate knowledge and understand the beauty of the occult. This understanding can generate a charge of psychological grandiosity that can result in a very toxic and dangerous misalignment with the individual. The magician can erase any trace of empathy and block all emotion, becoming a self-destructive machine, detached from human tact and possessed by intellectual affluence and the inexhaustible quest for power. In these last quadrants, the energy, unlike the magician, is more extroverted. The lover is charged with sensitivity, passion, and a constant desire to connect with the outside world through the senses. If the dragon inflates the lover with his grandiose energy, the individual will seek constant stimulation and will desire to be touched in all bodily and transcendental aspects. Similar to a baby seeking to be nursed, the lover may generate a polymorphic disorder and fall into a perversity in the pursuit of pleasure. The lover archetype operates in the realms of beauty, sexuality, and the various forms of love. Consumed by a divine force, the lover can fall into a long tendency to addictions and impulses of the erotic. For rather more addictions are disorders of the lover's quadrant. Anyone can suffer from this possession in the form of food, alcohol, sex, or anything else with addictive potential. Artists are constantly inflated by this energy. Their sensitivity leads to states of ecstasy and, similar to the magician, they can enter the world of the divine through stimulation and self-medication. This archetype is characterized by its aesthetic intensity and its inclination for pleasure in all its branches. If this energy is not assimilated in a conscious manner, one can fall into radical hedonism. The dragon here can cause great suffering and destroy the beauty of the bearer through the excesses that operate in this quadrant. It is important not to forget the danger of the dragon in this archetype. Decoding the psychic body leads us to Carl Jung and his psychoanalytical contributions. The idea of archetypes projected the different energies that move us collectively and that are present in all cultures, regardless of ethnic, religious, or aesthetic differences. These forces should not be repressed or ignored. With the symbol of the dragon that Robert shares with us in his book, we can appreciate this creature as a carrier of metaphysical grandiosity, and thus understand a little more of the dangers and opportunities of what happens when we find an inclination to feel more than we humanly can be with the energies of these four realms in the psyche. Everyone tends to suffer from one archetype more than another. The challenge is to find which ones affect us and try to master the dragon with awareness, respect and humility.